In the last unit, we looked at the properties of pure substances, particularly liquids. However, the vast majority of the world is actually a mixture of some sort. In this unit, we will examine the properties of homogeneous mixtures known as solutions. It's important to start with a few key terms. A solution itself is called, considered a homogeneous mixture of two or more components. Remember from the first semester of general chemistry that a homogeneous mixture is one in which the components are mixed together completely on a particle level. The net result is that the solution looks like it is one substance instead of being a mixture of two or more different substances. The components that are mixed together are called either solvent or solute. The solvent is the co component that is present in the greatest proportion, so we call it the majority component. Solutes are present in smaller proportion, so we call them the minority component. A solution can have multiple solutes dissolved in the solvent. An example is seawater, which is a variety of different salts dissolved in it. Solutions come in a variety of phases. Air is an excellent example of a gas phase solution. It's made up of gaseous nitrogen as the solvent and multiple gaseous solutes, including oxygen, carbon dioxide, and a wide variety of other trace gases. Liquid solutions can have gaseous, liquid, or solid solutes. Because these are all dissolved in a liquid solvent, the final solution itself is liquid. Notice that in all the examples given here, club soda, vodka, and seawater, the solvent is water. Water is a ubiquitous solvent in our world. Solutions that have water as a solvent are a special class of mixtures known as aqueous solutions. This is the primary type of solution we will deal with for the rest of the semester. Finally, solutions can also be found in solid form. Metallic alloys are homogeneous mixtures of different metals, such as copper and zinc in brass. One of the defining characteristics of any mixture is that the different components can be present in any proportion. For example, brass can contain anywhere from 5 to 50% zinc and still be considered brass. So why do solutes dissolve in different solvents? Just as intermolecular forces were the key to understanding pure liquid properties, they're also the key to dissolving. The adage goes that like dissolves like. The like referred to is a measure of polarity. Nonpolar substances tend to dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Similarly, polar substances dissolve in polar solvents. The closer the match in intermolecular force strength between the solute and the solvent, the greater the dissolving power of the solvent. Within a mixture of two components, you have three different types of intermolecular interactions. Both the solute and solvent have intermolecular interactions before mixing. These are the solvent-solvent and solute-solute interactions that occur between molecules of the same type. In order for a solution to form, the solute-solute and solvent-solvent interactions must be overcome and a new interaction must form between the solute and solvent particles when they mix. Whether or not this will happen depends upon the relative strength of these three different types of interactions. If the solvent-solute interactions are greater in strength than the solvent-solvent, and solute-solute interactions, then the solution will form. The solution will also form, though, if the solvent-solute interactions and the solvent-solvent and solute-solute interactions are all equal in strength. This is because, in nature, all things have a tendency to mix or spread out over time. This is the second law of thermodynamics, and we'll examine it in more depth later in the semester. But this tendency to mix helps the solvent-solute interactions predominate, even when they are equally matched in strength to the other interactions present. The 
tendency to mix can also help some solutions to form when the solute-solvent interactions are weaker than the original solute-solute and solvent-solvent interactions. If the solute-solvent interactions are only a little weaker than the original ones, the solution may form, but it will likely require the addition of some energy. If the solute-solvent interactions are much weaker than the original interactions, the solution will not form. A classic example of this last situation is oil and water. They don't mix, of course, and this is because the solvent-solvent interaction of hydrogen bonding between water molecules is so much stronger than the interactions between oil and water molecules. It requires too much energy to pull the water molecules apart. A good visual analogy is trying to mix magnetized spheres with marbles. Here we have a cube made out of neodymium spherical magnets. If we tried to break up the sphere and mix in glass marbles, it wouldn't work. No matter how much you try to mix the marbles in with the magnets, the magnets will attract each other strongly enough that they will stick back together and push out the marbles. The two will not mix. It's the same way with oil and water molecules. So like dissolves like is the rule of thumb when it comes to whether or not a solute will dissolve in a solvent. If two substances will dissolve in each other in any proportion, they are known as miscible. This term usually applies to solutions in which solute and solvent are in the same phase, such as a liquid solute and a liquid solvent. In this case, either substance can dissolve the other. Not all solvents have unlimited dissolving capacity for their solutes, however. For example, when trying to dissolve sugar in cold water, eventually the water will become saturated with the sugar solute. At that point, you won't be able to dissolve any more sugar. In this type of situation, we talk about the solubility of the solute in the solvent. Solubility refers to the amount of solute that will dissolve in a given amount of solvent. We can also refer to a saturated solution. In this type of solution, we have dissolved the maximum amount of solute in our solvent at a given temperature. No more solute should be able to dissolve. An unsaturated solution can dissolve more solute because it contains less than the maximum amount of solute. Finally, a supersaturated solution contains more than the maximum amount of solute. This type of solution is formed under special conditions and is generally unstable. Normally, the excess solute will precipitate out. In some cases, it does not, and we'll examine one example of this in class. A saturated solution represents a dynamic equilibrium that develops between two opposing processes, dissolution and recrystallization. Consider dissolving an ionic compound like potassium chloride in a beaker of water. Initially, dissolving predominates, and the ions, the dissociated ions of potassium and chloride spread throughout the water. Now, as more ions go into solution, they may approach each other again and begin to recrystallize. Because the rate of dissolving is faster initially, the compound will likely continue to dissolve. However, as more ions dissolve in solution, the rate of recrystallization will increase. And when the rate of recrystallization equals the rate of dissolution, the compound no longer dissolves. The solution is saturated and dynamic equilibrium has been reached. There are ways that you can increase or decrease solubility, of course. If you've ever tried to dissolve sugar in tea, you know you can dissolve a lot more sugar quickly if the tea is hot. This is because solubility is temperature dependent. There are a few exceptions, but for the most part, the solubility of solid solutes in water increases with increasing temperature. So here we have a graph showing solubility curves for several solid solutes dissolved in water. Temperature is on the x-axis, while solubility is on the y-axis.
And solubility is measured as the maximum amount of solute measured in units of grams that's capable of being dissolved per 100 grams of water. Now, some of the substances on this graph show a dramatic increase in solubility with temperature. Sugar and potassium nitrate are two such examples. So at 20 degrees Celsius, the solubility of, of sugar is about 200 grams per 100 grams of water. If you raise the temperature to around 65 degrees Celsius, though, the solubility of sugar rises dramatically to 300 grams per 100 gram of water. The increase is even larger for potassium nitrate. At around 10 degrees Celsius, you can dissolve 20 grams of potassium nitrate in every 100 grams of water increase the temperature to approximately 80 degrees though or a little bit higher and you can dissolve 180 grams of potassium nitrate say you went in reverse though and started with a saturated solution of potassium nitrate at 80 degrees celsius if you had 100 grams of water in the solution this means that you would have 180 grams of the solute dissolved if you then let the solution cool to about 10 degrees Celsius, all that extra potassium nitrate that dissolved at the higher temperature should crystallize out until the lower solubility limit is reached, until only 20 grams of the solute remain dissolved. Occasionally, the extra does not crystallize with cooling, and if it doesn't, this is a supersaturated solution. Providing a surface for the crystals to form on may help the extra to crystallize out, though. So if you've ever made rock candy, you've seen this effect. You create a saturated solution of sugar at high temperatures, and then you provide a surface like a stick or a piece of string for the extra sugar to crystallize out on. You let the solution sit for several days. As it cools and the water evaporates, the solution does become supersaturated. The supersaturated solution doesn't last forever though. The extra sugar will eventually crystallize out onto the stick forming rock candy. Gas solutes show a very different relationship between temperature and solubility. As temperature increases, the solubility of the gases actually decreases. As temperature increases, the kinetic energy of the gas particles will increase, meaning they're less likely to stay dissolved in a liquid solvent. Have you ever noticed that when you let a cold glass of water warm up to room temperature, little bubbles of air form on the side of the glass? This is the air that was dissolved in the water at colder temperatures actually coming out of solution as the water warms and the solubility of the gases decreases. Decreasing gas solubility with increase in water temperature can have some pretty significant effects on aquatic life. So this is a picture of a fish kill that occurred as a result of thermal pollution from a power plant discharging warm water from its cooling towers into an adjacent river. The warmer water resulted in a decrease in the solubility of oxygen gas. And with a significant reduction in the amount of dissolved oxygen available for the fish, they weren't able to survive. So let's consider another situation where the solubility of a gas suddenly changes. When you open a bottle or can of soda, even if the temperature of the bottle or can stays constant, opening it to the atmosphere can cause the carbon dioxide to fizz out a solution. And this happens because opening the bottle releases the pressure inside. And it turns out that pressure of the gas above a solution can also influence the solubility of that gas in the solution. So soda is usually bottled under a high pressure of carbon dioxide, usually somewhere around five atmospheres. 
And this increased pressure of CO2 over the surface causes those CO2 molecules to hit the surface of the solution with more force. And this makes it more likely that they'll actually dissolve into the solution. As a result, the solubility or the maximum amount of carbon dioxide dissolved increases. We can quantify this relationship between pressure and gas solubility using Henry's law. This states that the concentration of the gas in solution is directly proportional to the partial pressure of that gas above the solution. Mathematically, this is stated as the solubility of the gas, S subscript gas, is equal to a constant, K subscript H, known as the Henry Law constant. This is multiplied times the partial pressure of the gas. So Henry's Law constants are experimentally determined values that are specific to the gaseous solute involved. This table lists several gaseous solutes and their Henry's Law constants. Notice that the constants presented here are specifically for 25 degrees Celsius. Since gas solubility is also dependent on temperature, changing temperature will change the value of the constant. The units used in this calculation are molarity, or or moles of gas per liter of solution for the concentration of the gas. Moles per liter per atmosphere for the proportionality constant. Again, where that capital M stands for molarity, moles per liter. And atmospheres, ATM, for the partial pressure of the gas. Let's work our way through a sample calculation using Henry's Law. We want to find the partial pressure of carbon dioxide required to keep a concentration of 0.12 moles per liter in soda at 25 degrees Celsius. The Henry's Law constant for carbon dioxide at this temperature is 3.4 times 10 to the negative 2 moles per liter per atmosphere. As in any chemistry problem, the first step is to identify what you're given and what you're trying to find. In this case, we're given a concentration for carbon dioxide and a Henry's Law constant. We're asked to find the pressure. We know this is a Henry's Law problem because we're dealing with a gas in solution. Since we're asked to find the pressure of the gas, we can rearrange the Henry Law equation to isolate pressure by dividing both sides by the constant K. We can then substitute what we know into the formula and directly solve for the partial pressure of carbon dioxide necessary. The concentration of carbon dioxide we want is the solubility term S. Dividing this by the Henry's Law constant yields 3.5 atmospheres. Notice that the concentration units of molarity cancel out. Last but not least, we should do a quick check on whether our answer seems reasonable. The unit is correct for pressure, and the value for pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere. We know that soda is bottled under high pressure, so this higher value seems reasonable. In summary, solutions are homogeneous mixtures made up of a solute and a solvent. Solutes dissolve in solvents with similar polarities. Like dissolves like, in other words. Solubility is the maximum amount of a solute that will dissolve in a given amount of solvent. For solid solutes in liquid solutions, solubility generally increases with increasing temperature. For gaseous solutes in liquid solutions, however, solubility depends on both temperature and partial pressure of the gas. The solubility of gases decreases with increasing temperature and the solubility of gases increases with increasing partial pressure of the gas over solution. This last relationship is characterized by Henry's law.